Greetings. I hope you are all doing well this week. Some footage from the beautiful Wasatch Mountains, some of the springtime runoff from the mountain snow. So I hope you enjoy it. Before I get into this week's topic, I want to ask you a favor. Would you please go to my Odyssey channel, reinstall Paul at Odyssey, give me a follow there. I actually have more videos on Odyssey than I do on YouTube. I would greatly appreciate your follow there. So thank you. So this week, I want to talk about one big confusion of Western civilization. And this is something that I myself, as a Westerner, have um, had to work very hard on understanding. And still to this day, of course, I, I, um, I can find myself uh, consciously or unconsciously uh, making this mistake. So when it comes to understanding teaches, teachings from the East, such as Buddhism, yoga, and meditation, most people in the West seem to have a chronic misunderstanding. Now, it's not necessarily our fault, of course, and this isn't, you know, I'm not here to say this is good or bad, as we're trying, on this channel, I'm trying to kind of, you know, transcend this dualistic way of seeing the world. But really, you know, our minds, and the way they work, and I'm sure this is also true to a large degree if the West is brought eastward, and the, when the when the East is reflecting, it's it's uh, what it how it perceives the West. It's reflecting it back at us. We can also see, well, isn't that silly? They're, how they're doing it. Um, so, you know, we both have these kind of disparate worldviews uh, in East and West. And I want to explain that also all Westerners aren't unconsciously doing this, but I would say it's safe to presume that most are. Now, the thing with being a Westerner is that we try to understand everything in Western terms, okay? For example, uh, we define yoga or understand yoga as a physical exercise because we generally don't conceive of physical and spiritual having a non-dual sort of uh, union with each other, right? That's not really a Western uh, concept. So yoga means union, presumably union with God, by the way. Yoga isn't something that you do, okay, despite the wrong thinking of millions of people who do yoga in the West. Yoga is a process and it's a way to live. It's not, you know, I'm going to yoga. I did yoga today and I went, no, yeah, that's not what that is at all. So that's one example. So what causes us in the West to create labels and definitions for the East and, you know, prescribe our own uh, way of seeing the world and kind of just laying that lens on top of, you know, something that's entirely uh, different. So we have a 500 year history, give or take, in the West of conquering, exploiting, and abusing the Eastern part of the world. We've also exploited the Western Hemisphere, and we're pretty good about abusing ourselves at this point as well. It's something taught to us by the feudal or the neo-feudal, uh, sort of that Game of Thrones thinking where might makes right. That, that type of thinking um, we all have unconsciously accepted for the most part. Now, if the might makes right situation manifests itself right in front of you and you are witness to it, you will see quite clearly its ugliness and you will... Um, not want to be part of that. However, this sort of thinking, and I've talked about this before in previous videos, but this sort of thinking has an unconscious hold that we're just simply not aware of. Okay. Now, this isn't to say that gains and progress haven't been made in the West. We don't, you know, for example, um, 
we don't tolerate or accept violence like we used to, okay? You know, in the 1800s and even in the early 1900s, for example, Americans would simply just accept, they would have to accept that the government would often quell uprisings by just killing dozens, if not hundreds of people, okay? That was something that was considered normal not a very long time ago, actually, okay? It's only in the you know the past three or four generations that people really um, in the West don't accept this ugliness anymore, okay? Now, granted, it takes a great degree of effort to try and see things in a seemingly uh, contrary Eastern view, uh, and not being from the Orient, uh, we may likely never fully understand the uh, sort of holistic, uh, systematic uh, view. But my hope is that any glaring misunderstandings or blind spots uh, that I'm talking about in this video will be responded to in the comments, um, especially the things that I don't see. I would really like to hear some of your comments in terms of what your thoughts are about the differences between East and West and how we can reconcile that. So for certain, what I expect um, to see in the comments is sort of a um, an effort to understand. I think there's a lot of drive-by commenting in social media in general where we just kind of blurt out an opinion but not really um, ask questions and try to understand, okay? And I've asked questions of Eastern philosophy and its teachings for a very long time and, and, and I'm still, and I will always be, when I say I'm still learning, I will always be learning. There'll, there'll, there'll never be, uh, it'll never be finished uh, learning about anything, whether it be a Western uh, teaching or an inherently Eastern teaching. But the point I want to get across is that the Western mind has this compulsion to control. And when we have this compulsion to control in terms of just understanding a concept, it means that we have this unconscious uh, habit of creating a certain um, framework, if you will. And once we create a box or a framework, um, then we can sort of take a concept, a Eastern philosophical con concept, maybe you know some, something with Buddhism or yoga, whatever, whatever it is, or holism, non-dualism, and we can put it inside of a framework and then we're comfortable with it after that, okay? Well, that's kind of a big mistake because, you know, reality is a process and it's always unfolding and it, it doesn't exist in a framework. So it's why so many philosophies and isms of any variety and institutions in the West have, you know, been built up and have had their time in the sun and then eventually they fall down and a new way emerges um, and we look at the old ways and we say well gosh that was completely unfounded and that was wrong and we're not going to do that anymore or that sort of thing without realizing that if we're always concerned with creating the new framework that proves the old one wrong you can guarantee that the framework that currently exists uh, in in the western mind will eventually fall down because it's not process oriented, it's rather fixed, okay? And when we have a fixed way of thinking, when we have a framework, when we put something in kind of a box, okay? Because that's really what we're doing, then we're not honoring the process, we're not honoring the fact that, you know, there's so much that we don't know and that we should just kind of not hold on so tightly to understanding, but instead release our grip in order 
to explore the process in a very open way without so much rigid institutional rules, groupthink, all this kind of stuff. Now, if this sounds like mumbo jumbo, like the new age kind of mumbo jumbo that I hear, well, it's certainly not because I've always been talking about reconciling spirituality with science. Okay, that's nothing new. But see, in the East, that's nothing new at all. Um, you know, I'm reading uh, autobiography of a yogi, for example. Um, it's uh, written by Paramahansa uh, Yogananda. And there is no sort of conflict between religion and science. In fact, um, there are several chapters with very uh, highly respected scientific people in this book that are um, very uh, spiritual, very religious, and not necessarily institutionally uh, religious, I'm saying. But we have this sort of um, problem in the West where if it doesn't fit kind of the, the predominant view, the predominant box that our Western civilization has built, then we kind of throw it out. And if you think really deeply and reflect on that, and I'm, I know, I realize as, you know, as a Westerner myself, uh, we can get caught up in these sort of frameworks or these sort of um, boxes that we make only, you know, to have them be kind of, you know, <laughs> leaking water at, at, at every which way at some point and then being proven wrong. Well, we don't really have to operate on that level and institutionalize everything only to find <laughs> that we've confused the institution with the spirit of the idea, right? And so in the Eastern sense, what I gather so far in my study of Eastern philosophy and, and how the Eastern mind works is that there's a very open attitude to exploring things where, you know, the practical benefits of science and spirituality that are um, clearly evident in the lives of people um, and how people's um, spiritual, emotional health has improved as, as in addition to just the overall technological progress um, that is available through uh, science, I feel like I feel like they shouldn't be opposed at all, as a matter of fact. And to have some sort of opposition between um, sort of the Western reductionist scientific uh, worldview where somehow we've outgrown this idea of God, <laughs> when in reality all we have done, is confuse the institution for the reality of God and we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Because that's really what we're doing. Instead of doing that, we can maybe think about how much more interesting would the world be if we didn't see things in such uh, futile um you know, this is better than that, hierarchical ways of thinking, and instead started thinking in terms of, well, what's really useful? What's really helpful, right? Is science helpful? Yes. It's, is it useful? Yes, of course. Is mental health, physical health, spiritual health, is that useful? Is that practical? Absolutely. And why someone would reject, you know, their spiritual uh, life, okay, and or confuse that with the institutionalized religion, which is, you know, in my mind is groupthink. I'm not against religion per se, but I'm also not against um, schools of thought when we're talking about uh, scientific inqu inquiry as well. But those schools of thought are very limited and they create a box, and they create a framework, and there's no room for any sort of introspection or there's no sort of, you know, 
room to grow outside of that type of thinking without being uh, completely um, outcast and accused of all sorts of things. That That's a West, very Western thing. Well, in the East, it's just not that way. I mean, look at how many just, I can't, I've studied, I don't know how long I've been studying religions of India. There must be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of religions. Okay. And the reason for that, because, you know, there's a majority um, religion in India, but depending on where you go, that majority uh, type of religion, okay, doesn't resemble at all um, what you may have seen in the in, in a previous uh, you know province. So, my message this week is that we have to realize that in the West we're very sick, and we have. We have a real problem, but that real problem really comes down to trying to control everything unconsciously. This neo-feudal uh, compulsion to control or believe that there's a hierarchy and that someone is above us and someone else is below this person and we're below them but above that person and that kind of thinking is a wild confusion. And even to think that God is above us right that also um, gets rejected in the west um, but also it's a false idea that idea does not hold water in the east right and nor does it hold water in judaism god is not above you you're not below god okay you you either move towards god or away and there is no such thing as up or down anyway in the universe if you think about it <laughs> I won't go too much into that, but um, suffice it to say, that's the message for this week. So let me know what your questions are, uh, what your comments are, and also follow me on Odyssey. Thank you, and have yourself a wonderful week.